to the Shooting Times podcast, which is brought to you by Field Sports Press. I'm joined today by Dr. Mark Avery. Mark, I don't know really how to introduce you. You were formerly head of conservation at the RSPB. You're a prolific book writer, and we'll be talking about your latest book today. Um, you are what, what, you're a former field contributor um, some time ago yeah. now. Um, but, but how do you how do you self identify? Well, all those things you've said are true. Uh, I'm also one of the three founders of Wild Justice, which will make me um, incredibly popular with many of your uh, readership. Uh, I have been trustee and chair of an excellent organisation called the World Land Trust. Basically, I'm an environmentalist who's mostly interested in wildlife uh, and wants to see the world change because wildlife is in trouble and in fact our environment is in trouble so i look at the world and i'm not happy with it and i'd quite like to change it so i always think it's interesting to get people on and to chat to people who have views that differ from one's own or you know who who have sort of interesting takes on things so you know there will be lots of listeners who think why on earth have we got mark avery on the podcast um you know and i hope that that will become apparent and it will be sort of you know um it will be useful and rich and interesting uh, i meet lots of people who are shooters for example who tell me what i believe and i say no, I don't know where you've got that from. That's not what I think at all. And they look rather quizzically at me as they, they would know better than I do about what I believe, what's in my head and what I've written down. I've written millions of words. Um, and it's as though nobody's ever read any of them. And I've been on loads of podcasts and given loads of talks. And yet I still get loads of people telling me that I want to shut down all of shooting and various other things which simply aren't true well let's uh we'll we'll get there in due course what we <laughs> always start with is looking at the news stories in the latest issue of shooting times so the news stories we are looking at hit the shelves tomorrow uh the 27th it's been quite an interesting time in field sports and countryside news um i think mark let's start with the record year for hen harriers um, is this a story that you've been keeping up with? Uh, Tony Juniper has said that the encouraging numbers we see again this year are testament to volunteers, landowners and partner organisations who have worked so hard to support and monitor these birds. I mean, do you think that the picture is becoming a more positive one for raptors in the uplands? Uh, it is for hen harriers, yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Uh, there's been a fairly remarkable increase in numbers of breeding pairs and birds fledged. Mm. Uh, what mm. we haven't seen is a reduction in the number of them that are bumped off. Uh, right. right. And obviously, <laughs> well, uh, there are some people who say that this um, brood meddling scheme is behind this increase. I think yeah. that must be true to an extent, but it's not the whole thing. And, um, you know, if you um, take hen harriers into captivity, rear them, release them, and then shoot them before they're old enough to have babies of their own, it's a bit like a put-and-take pheasant shoot or partridge shoot. Well, um, you were saying that, you know, there aren't any fewer hen harriers being bumped off than in previous years what what do you put the current rate of hen harrier persecution at what number do you well it's a bit difficult to, to know isn't it because um the data uh natural england are a bit reticent about publishing the data very quickly but we know i think we know that about a third of um brood meddled hen harriers have have died before they produce any young. That's quite a lot. I mean, if they've been shot, which some of them have been, and others, their satellite tags have stopped working uh, in ways that are consistent <laughs> with the birds having been bumped off, um, that's not a good situation. And it's not just the Natural England birds. RSPB published some data earlier this year as well. So mm, we don't mm. see enough of those birds um, uh, surviving to breed. And that's terrible. 
because they're completely protected by law and have been for what what would be the normal mortality rate for uh hen harrier chicks reaching what what would you expect how many would you expect to reach adulthood well it's a bit they've got to tell because um Nobody's nobody's got the figures in a from a UK where there was rampant, widespread, routine illegal persecution of hen harriers. It just seems as though you're very sure that the numbers have remained consistent, but you can't actually give me what those numbers are. Well, you can look at the figures. Uh, you don't actually have to know what the figures are, which is what you asked me to know that they yeah. haven't changed much. Because they and they haven't right, changed. Right, right. So you're looking sceptical at me, Patrick. No, 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 no. I suppose <laughs> what I'm saying is that you're very sure that the numbers haven't changed, but you don't seem to know what the numbers. It'd be useful to know what those numbers actually are, so that you know. I mean, rather than just saying, <laughs> let's that they not haven't... pretend that they're not known. They could go away and look them up, but it would take a little yeah. while to do it. So, um, sort of not beating around the bush, Mark. Your view is that hen harrier persecution is is just as bad as it ever was. Uh, seems to be it's mostly concentrated on shooting flying birds rather than destroying nests. So it is about a third of the natural England satellite tag birds have been killed. That's yeah. not good. Yeah, nobody could say that. No, it's good, not good. They? No, no. Uh, so, and you don't you don't think the situation is improving culturally or? Well, I don't know. I should think you'd be in a better place um, to know that than I am. Uh, I've been told that yeah. nobody ever. I've been told nobody ever kills hen harriers, and that everybody who owns, manages, or visits a grouse moor is the best friend of the hen harrier for twenty years. Yeah, things are things are I moved mean... in terms of nesting numbers, but it doesn't look great in terms of survival of the birds that come out of those nests. So not enough has changed. Yeah. Things are getting better. I said that right at the beginning. Things are getting yeah, better, yeah. looks better, but it isn't yet good. No, I mean, look, I mean, in the, in the time that I've been at Shooting Times, and this is my uh, penultimate week, um, you know, when I used to write editorial leaders saying that we really should stop uh, raptor persecution, you would get three or four letters saying, really, you know, you mustn't ever talk about this and, and we must just pretend that, you know, it doesn't go on. Uh, that situation, I think, has, has, has changed in a big, big way. You know, so, so we will now receive three or four letters a month saying that people really must stop persecuting raptors. So, you know, I think there's a kind of collective feeling that, you know, shooting has a lot of challenges at the moment and that we shouldn't, you know, create any more than we've already got or, or make the situation worse. So it's... Um, that's true. I can imagine that six years ago people said that. But when I wrote this book, yeah, which was uh, eight years ago, in here, mm. I'll probably be able to find it, it says that the spread of satellite tagging of birds of prey will be, could be one of the things that finishes off driven grey shooting, because there is no avoiding the fact that birds are being killed if lots of them are satellite tagged. And we're in that position still. So, you mm. know, mm. two cheers for what's happened, but not three cheers. <laughs> and I, I, I still think driven grey shooting is on its way out for a variety of reasons. Because mm. of mm. Um, public opinion, because of spread of disease amongst red grouse, because of climate change, because uh, it's nowhere near a sexy uh, a thing to say that you own a grouse moor or you've gone grouse shooting as it was 10 years ago. Isn't it that, that dodgy hobby that depends on killing lots of birds of prey and lots of other things? So it's going to go. So what, do, what would the perfect day of grouse shooting look like to you? I mean, you know, you don't object to grouse shooting wholesale, I imagine. No, walked up shooting, can't see any problem in that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But you can't make loads of money out of it, can you? I think that's well, you one can't. Of the you, you you can't consistently make loads of money out of driven grouse shooting. You know, I mean, there are people who've done fairly well out of it, but there aren't lots of them, and it's getting harder and harder. Um, you know, I think we. You know, if you talk to people like Lindsay Waddell, uh, he will say to you that, you know, where grouse shooting went wrong was when it became an industry. Um, and, you know, he thinks we're sort of moving back to where we were 
where it's about sort of a sustainable surplus rather than um, you know trying to end up as with as many grouse as you can, which is uh, which is interesting. Well, I, I I'd agree with him on that. Yeah, but there aren't many estates moving back in that direction, are there? I think there are. Yeah, are there? yeah, yeah. I think I probably. Where are I, they, think I have. Well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to name <laughs> names. But but I mean, yeah. I, I I at the moment have have. I'm writing a book on land access, and uh, so I've been talking to lots of keepers in the uplands, and and there are some really impressive keepers out there who just quietly kind of get on and do their thing. Um, you know, I think it's always look. I mean. I find it really valuable to talk to animal rights activists and people who dislike shooting and people who dislike managing land in, in, in various ways. Um, you know, and I think that people who have particular views around driven grouse shooting would probably find a day out with a grouse keeper to be a really, really rich experience. And, you know, if you do it in springtime, you've got the added bonus of seeing you know, all the curlew and the lapwing and all that sort of I think being in the uplands in spring is really, a, a you know, it's, it's nature at its best. The United Utilities story, is that one that you followed at all, Mark? Them saying that they were going to do something and then saying that they might not do it. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I imagine from your, from your RFPB I think days... I Rishi Sunak is heading for a place on their board almost immediately he loses the next general election because he seems quite good at that. Well, it is a bizarre thing. It's just a bizarre thing to say that we're not going to reissue any grouse shooting licenses and then to say, actually, you know what, we've had to think about it and uh, we're going to talk to all the stakeholders to see what they're saying before we do anything. And it's like, how can you piss off the grouse shooting world and, you know, everybody who was agitating for a ban on grouse shooting on your ground? It's sort of like, you know, it's like the worst PR exercise you could possibly imagine. When uh, opinions are so divided, which we'd all have to admit they are on this subject, it's quite difficult. Difficult to please everyone, and but most people end up not pleasing anyone. I think where, yeah. as I understand it, where United Utilities are is that they said that they are going to review them, and they'll review them on a case by case basis. I bet they'll issue fewer licenses in the future yeah. than exists now. So um, you could, the shooting industry could have a little chortle at um, a PR slip up. Um, but I think the direction of travel is only going to be in one direction. That would be my guess. I don't know mm. anything mm. about the inner workings of United Utilities. I would say we're talking about chortling that it's not really a, a, a laughing matter. You know, you've got people who are employed on the ground. You've got people who are reliant on, on grouse shooting. And, you know, whether you sort of disagree with it or not, I don't really want to live in a world where, you know, stakeholders as it were just get sort of thrown under the bus um you know well, in pursuit of a little bit of pr glory uh no um but um if you believe as i do and lots of other people do that driven grouse shooting is underpinned by illegal activity wildlife crime you lose some of that sympathy yeah, they aren't all driven grouse moors. Not all the tenants are shooting driven grouse. Um, we have a very interesting column in this week's issue on uh, trail hunting now, as is. Um, do you think, Mark, that it is easier to defend fox hunting than, say, uh, driven grouse shooting or, you know, commercial pheasant shoots? Or, you know, are you a, uh, are you a pro hunting man or not? Um, I'm not pro hunting man i've never been um engaged in any campaigns against hunting um mm, mm. there is there is just the thing that it is illegal to fo hunt foxes now so i think we this is a discussion that was had quite some time ago um yeah so um it's over and yeah kind of looks like some people won't stick to the law on this one either you know maybe, maybe you're a more law-abiding person than i am i mean i was very interested in uh chris packham's program the other night on you know whether we should break the law in pursuit of climate justice now you know that's that's perfectly valid um you know if he wants to do that then sort of fair play but if you are a person who thinks that the ban on fox hunting was a cynical political move and you know tony blair later said that he very much regretted it and didn't actually understand fox hunting you know would you be according to chris's logic right to 
break the law and go out fox hunting because you know you think that the whole thing was 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 wrong i mean are there some laws that we should be able to break and some laws that we shouldn't be able to to, to break well my understanding of what tony blair said was that he was a bit uh, um regretful about taking on fox hunting because it took up so much of his time and it wasn't that important really but I, i'm not sure he was that regretful about having done it it was um the process. He did say that. But, he did say that. Well, he said he I didn't think... understand. He said he didn't understand the countryside. And, and that's a worrying, I mean, it's a little bit like United Utilities. You know, I think you have people in rural Britain who sort of, you know, get kind of kicked um, just just because it, it gains well, people a bit of political clarity. Where were you sitting at the moment, Patrick? I'm sitting in, in Camberwell. In London. London. But, sorry, I don't I'm understand. But in that's not relevant. I'm always being told that I'm an urban person. I've kind yeah. of lived in the countryside, not shooting it or ploughing it up or anything, but within a few hundred yards of the field almost all mm. my life. Those people who are doing fox hunting are not mm. um, openly doing it. They are clandestinely breaking the law. So if they said, uh, we're going to protest by uh, meeting at this place at this time, and we're going to go out with our hands and kill some foxes, uh, I'd have a bit more respect for them. And I'd expect um, the coppers to be there to arrest them. And then they'd have to take the consequences of breaking the law. I don't think you'll find, I don't know what Chris Packham will do, uh, but I don't think you'll find him sneaking off and breaking the law and not telling anyone about it. If he breaks the law, it'll be on TV. And it would yeah, be as a yeah. protest. And I admire people who would, uh, like the suffragettes and like lots of other protest groups in history, who will break the law if they feel it's um, an unjust law. That's obviously yeah. a matter of opinion. It might be right or wrong. But if they break the law and take the consequences, they are, they are <clears throat> worthy protesters. Provided yeah. they do it in a non-violent way, which again, I can't imagine Chris thumping somebody. But he could be yeah. very good at it. I think I think we're on the same page. I'm also pro open fox hunting as a protest. I think we're on the we're on the same page on that. When uh, quite an interesting piece Alan Edwards has written um, about the role of beaters in the countryside. I don't know if you've come across Alan Edwards. He's got an interesting gamekeeper. And he just talks about how much he enjoys being in the beating line and talking to young beaters about, you know, how much they enjoy beating. And uh, he said one of them he was talking to the other day was saving up for a new bicycle and all that kind of thing. Um, you know, when wild justice go after uh, releasing pheasants or uh, pigeon shooting or, or whatever it may be. Um, do you have any sense, and I don't mean this in a, in, a, in a critical way, I just wonder if you do have any sense of sort of destroying parts of rural life, or does that not really bother you? Well, uh, I don't accept the premise of the question. So wild justice do not go after those people. We go after... Uh, government departments and government agencies and say you are breaking the law and we have had quite a lot of success in that. You couldn't get much more of a middle class um, entirely reasonable approach to say hang on, these general licences are not lawful and we have made yeah. a lot of progress yeah. in England, <laughs> Wales, Northern Ireland where Sometimes we've won legal cases, and sometimes we've lost them. But in all cases, the situation has changed in the direction that we suggested. Now, that isn't persecuting yeah. any... Well, it's persecuting a load of civil servants and ministers. And then the people, and then the people who can no longer do the things they were doing. So I'm not... I'm, you know, I'm, this isn't about whether sort of shooting's right or shooting's wrong. But, you know, do you sort of value... Um, rural culture and think that it's something worth preserving or you know are you happy to see rural culture sort of you know, destroyed piecemeal because of oh. the activities of wild justice <laughs> well rural culture i do not accept the premise of the question rural culture will not be destroyed at all and won't be destroyed piecemeal by the activities of wild justice 
if they, if there are some laws that aren't being enforced and implemented, then we will go for the establishment who ought to be making sure that they are. So getting yeah, the laws yeah. that exist implemented properly, uh, I don't apologise for that. No, I suppose it's a little bit like the fox hunting thing, though. So you're going, you think, for the establishment for a, for a sort of legal win. And then perhaps because you don't know them or uh, there are all of these people who are affected who you don't see, uh, you know, rural people doing things in the countryside. You know, and, and that, to well, me, no, no, is, is, is interesting. I do, see, I do see rural people in the countryside doing things. I mean, I can go past and see a, a line of beaters and a pheasant shoot any um saturday in the pheasant shooting season yeah, if yeah. i go out and look for when, them, when I, you, can, um... I can hear the guns from where i'm sitting now you've gone back to trying to tell me from your seat in london that i'm a townie that doesn't know anything about rural things get off it no no that wasn't, that, wasn't, that wasn't what i said there's a sort of insecurity thing coming out here and um, that's not what i said <laughs> Um, when you see the beaters, um, how do you? Is that something that you 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 sort of value as being part of, or how does that make you feel? Uh, I'm not trying to ban pheasant shooting or partridge shooting. Uh, mm. I don't want to go out and do it. It seems a yeah. slightly odd thing to do to me. I can kind yeah. of more yeah. empathise with wildfowling because it's a bit yeah. like bird watching, except you know you get cold. You're out a long way from anywhere. Uh, maybe nothing, you won't see anything that you want to see. But if you do, uh, the wildfowler will shoot it and I'll look at it. Now, wildfowling yeah. appears to me to be much closer to taking a sustainable harvest from a wild population than rearing and releasing Million, tens of millions of pheasants and just over 10 million red leg partridges. That's a bit. Yeah, yeah. Now, if people want yeah. to go out and do that, fine. But yeah, they'll have to stick yeah. to the law. And, yeah, and most of yeah. them are. Most of them are. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you have any. Um, I, I, so, moving on, I think, to your book, you talk about in the introduction that if we are to succeed in restoring wildlife, you hate the word biodiversity, you say, um, it's going to be a collective effort. We're all, you don't quite say it, but we're all going to have to muck in together, right? Now, you're very hung up on this notion of me being in SE5 and Camberwell and you being in the countryside. And you know, Do you look back and think um, at any point that you have done things that have sort of created division rather than bringing people together because you do seem to be saying that if we're going to make progress um you know we're going to have to do it together you know, do you have any regrets with wild justice or any other campaigning down the years uh i'm great i'm one more of them <laughs> but but uh, uh i don't know really i don't know not great regrets because <laughs> i we all we all have regrets come on we all have regrets uh we do uh, not many of them are about campaigning for me, though. <laughs> so no. uh, I have spent a lot of time uh, negotiating and in meetings talking to the other side, whether it's uh, farmers when I were, or farming organisations like the NFU when I worked yeah. for the OSPB. Whether it's shooting. Why do you say this? This whole thing of um, this whole thing of the other side. You're very into sides. What? what where, when did you start to think in that way? I mean, because you know, wildfowlers used to be RSPB members, and farmers used to be sort of into birds and so on. Like, what, you know, when? Do, when do you think? I don't really believe in sides in the way that I think you do. Um, when did those divisions open up? At what sort of stage in your career do you think you first started to see them? So you don't want me to finish answering your first question. You want me to move on to this question. Oh, I thought you were going, I, yeah, yeah go, yeah, go on to this one. I think it was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, you told me I, you had no regrets. You told me you had no regrets. That's because yeah. I've spent a lot of time in, in rooms trying to find a way forward. And I've negotiated some quite good things with people who were not on the same page as I was in the past. Yeah, um, yeah. And that is a good way forward. That's, the, that's yeah. the way we all, and it says this in my book, that's mm. the way we should all try to do it at first. If, if you're in those meetings, if you're in a meeting with uh, DEFRA ministers, and let's say the NFU were saying one thing and you're saying the other thing, uh, then they do feel like the other side. Now, is it my fault 
that they feel like the other side, because I'm pretty sure I felt like the other side to them. When people differ, there's no point pretending that we're all on the same side. And it's a, it's a tussle. It's a debate. It's a struggle between two future scenarios. And yeah. as I said right at the beginning, it's... I look at the world yeah. and I'd like to see it differently. I'm trying to change it. There are a load of people who don't want to see it differently. I don't expect them just to roll over and say, at Mark Avery, he's written a nice yeah. book, so let's all give in. So it's a struggle. It's just an interesting... And they uh, are the other side. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I, I, I don't... Perhaps I just don't come across that sort of partisanship. I mean, there was a really good example at the weekend. I was at a Right to Rome protest, uh, a land access protest on the Scottish border. I'd be interested to know where you sit on that whole thing. And a guy who's part of organising Right to Rome said to me that he's very keen to get his firearm certificate because he wants to start deer stalking. You know, I thought it was really interesting because there'll be people who shoot who would assume they would go along to a land access protest and not find anybody who would have any common interest with them. But, you know, I, I personally find it actually incredibly reassuring that, you know, wherever I go, I, I, I meet people who are uh, on the same page or whose pages, you know, overlap. Well, um, my my uh, freezer, the, I think probably the only meat in my freezer is venison that was really? shot in, uh, mostly in Scotland, where I have yeah. a friendly source who will bring me a Christmas present of the big freezer box full of venison. It's, it's not shot with lead, so yeah. I'm completely happy. If wood pigeons, pheasants and partridges were all shot with steel shot, there'd be some of them in my freezer too. Have you ever so shot, ever? I did shoot two rabbits once, <laughs> but I think I missed about six. So I can't <laughs> say I've really ever shot. I did at a game fair quite a long time ago. I went on one of those clay pigeon have a go type things, pay 10 quid and have six shots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think I've got two of them or something like that. So uh, <laughs> not really. Would you like to? So um, I haven't shot. I haven't hunted. Uh, I've hardly ever sat on a horse. I've bet on horses, but not sat on them. Um, uh, and I used to fish as a kid. So I've caught a few yeah. trout and a lot of minnows and gudgeon yeah. and a few other things. So you would say you, you, you get it. You get the hunter-gatherer thing, as evidenced by your black brain. Yeah, and as evidenced by a... Um, a super article I wrote for the field some time ago where, where I said that there's quite a lot of similarity between twitchers, which I'm not a yeah. twitcher, who go chasing around trying to see as many rare birds as possible, and some shooters who want a big day. And there's a certain amount of similarity with some bird ringers as a sport. And it's quite like a sport, after all, using misnets that the Japanese invented to catch birds, not to ring them, but to eat them. So, yeah, there is a thing. Your writing, I think, is very good. There's a sort of, there's a sort of slightly melancholy tone to it, which is inevitable, perhaps, given the subject matter uh, and talking about how many things you've lost and you know places that you used to go, which were full of nightingales, and there are no nightingales there anymore. Um, in terms of the sort of state of nature writing, so what you don't do is you don't uh, to reference. You know, Chris Packham, have your fingers in the sparkle jar. You don't kind of go off down the lane thinking that the world is wonderful and beautiful and magical and, you know, feeling. So that is quite interesting to me. What what do you get out of nature? Because you don't have that sort of contemporary nature writing thing of, of saying that, you know, it's about wonder and awe and all of that sort of thing. You obviously miss those bits in the book. There's a bit of that in chapter one. In fact, if you look at the um, rather amazing things that people have said about this book. Tim Smith calls it a love letter to nature, which rather surprised me because I didn't think I'd written a love letter to nature. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, all, I, there's a difference between being me being a bird watcher and me being a conservationist. So bird yeah, watcher, I'm yeah. quite happy to um, look out of my window and look at birds and think that they're great. And there's a bit of me as a scientist that looks at them and goes, 
I wonder why that one's doing that. What's happening there? That's oh, really? Yeah, that's interesting. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But I'm there to try and make the state of nature better and stop it from getting worse all the time. You write that in 1901, there were 38.2 million people in the UK, as was then. Um, you know, it's quite a controversial topic, but do you think the increase in, in the population has been detrimental to nature or or not in, uh, in this country? Well, it must have been, mustn't it? Because we've covered a lot of the country with concrete. Uh, yeah, we yeah. built roads all over it. There's a very good book called Trafication by a guy called Paul Donald. After yeah. your listeners have bought and read my book, you buy and read his book, which makes a very good case for the uh, the impact of roads on all sorts of wildlife. Uh, our footprint uh, has gone up enormously. Yeah. So we yeah. are taking more and more from the world uh, and it's struggling to provide it. And we are the wealthy West. So our lifestyle has got a bigger footprint than others. Yeah. Do you think that you talk about the the idea that actually there aren't many people who really care? I mean, are you positive about the future and wildlife and, and you know improving biodiversity as you as you sort of hate saying, but um or, or or not? I mean, do you think human nature is compatible with those things or do you think humans are essentially sort of takers and are inherently destructive? What what I actually wrote was that Though there's a figure bandied around that says there are 8 million supporters of a load of wildlife and environmental charities. There's nothing yeah. like that number. Because 5 million of them are in the National Trust who are yeah. interested in scones rather than scoters. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's a million in the RSPB and a million in the Wildlife Trust, and they're mostly the same million people. I'm a member of both. Mm. So yeah. when you whittle it down, there aren't that many of those memberships who are really active. There aren't that many, and most of them aren't that active. Now, there are a lot more yeah. people who are interested in wildlife but aren't even included in that. But if we're going to create a better world for wildlife, we're going to need to mobilise more of those people, and it will yeah. have to become an election issue. And I think it's quite interesting that sewage in rivers has brought together a whole load of different people. It's people Mm -hmm. who don't Mm -hmm. like um, the stench from the local stream or river at the bottom of their garden. It's the people who want to go and swim in the sea or rivers and don't want to have stomach upsets. And it's the people who um, love wildlife and don't want to see polluted waterways that's a bit like yeah yeah i mean it's different but it's a bit like a coalition around stopping driven dry shooting a lot of people who don't like the idea of people killing things a lot of people who don't like the idea of carbon emissions from the land use that uh is there a lot of people who um think that birds of prey shouldn't be killed illegally it's a whole bunch of reasons as a as a campaigner, when you kick an issue into touch, so like pheasant releasing or, or, or pigeons, do you lament the inevitability that lots of people get very upset and there's lots of angst around it? Or or do you as a campaigner sort of relish that to some degree? I just want to understand the sort of campaigner mindset. Probably neither. Right, right. I'll just move on to the next thing. The world is full of causes that need a bit of attention. So uh, I definitely don't relish the fact that some people are upset or inconvenienced. But then, you know, that's true of almost every social change. It will be true of giving, it will be true of gender equality and fair pay across men and women, that some men will get paid less, probably. And some women will get paid more. Some of the men might be a bit pissed off. And then just as a last question, those who shoot are lucky often to have patches of land that they 
look after that are sort of in their custodianship as it were although i find that a slightly irritating word you know what do you what would you like to see shoot owners and landowners doing you know what are our listeners you know is it building ponds is it restoring hedges you know they've got the manpower there often to do it and and you know a lot of people who shoot are very into conservation you know what are the uh what are the sort of easy wins what should everybody be doing do you think as a conservationist well i think um there should be a load of agri-environment options that will work for game shooting and for general wildlife. And so those are things to take up. But I'm not sure it is the short term. I think the long term thing, a bit like you said, Lindsay Waddell was saying about driven grey shooting, is to get back, or we can't go back, get forward to a situation where shooting is more about shooting a shootable surplus of wild birds rather than yeah. uh, captive rearing, letting out a load of not very wild birds and then shooting them a few weeks later. That, yeah. That's a sport. Yeah. That's not a great position to be in, is it? Yeah. That doesn't seem yeah. like it to me. So, you know... Um, I, I would agree with you. I think I think there's a worry among people here that um, you know people like yourself perhaps will campaign for various wild birds to come off the quarry list. Are you staying up late at night plotting moves like that, or, or are go to, the mallard shooters very safe? Very early these days. <laughs> but, um, well, um, has wild justice campaigned to get any species off the quarry list? No. Have we campaigned? to shorten the shooting season for woodcock, absolutely in line with what GWCT say people should do, yes, we yeah. have. And we will yeah. press that. And that puts shooting in a very bad light, I think. I mean, you know, we said, everybody says, you shouldn't shoot woodcock before, what is it, 1st of December, when yeah. all the continental, most of the continental birds have arrived and they have... Um, swamped our declining UK breeding population. That's what the shooting industry or hobby, whichever way you want to call yeah, it, yeah. has been saying. When Wild Justice says it, they all go, oh, no, 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 can't do that. Why is Interesting. that? Interesting. It must be an us and them type thing, the thing you accuse me of. But, I mean, no, I don't know. Question, we, haven't, yeah. we haven't tried to get anything off the shooting list. Mm. And we've said something mm. very sensible about the shooting season of one species. We've said the same yeah. thing that shooting appears to believe and had basically no support from shooters. So is that going to make... I mean, Chris, a... Chris, Chris Packham has called for a ban on shooting snipe and shooting woodcock. He called, uh, se- separately. He called for a five-year moratorium. Not well, a... I've... I've I... I know. I mean, I, I, he has called for that in 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 you know, when I have been with him. You know, he has said to me, "What do you think of this as an idea?" So just sort of, you know. So he um, has he has called he has called for a ban on shooting woodcock and snipe. Just to be absolutely clear. Okay, well, justice hasn't. You're living no. in the past. Chris actually had a petition which was about um, a five-year moratorium for some red-listed species. Yeah. That's, How long ago that, was that? It must be quite a long time ago. It was like about yeah. six years ago, so it's probably seven or eight years ago, something like that. Is but that... Wild Justice hasn't done that. We haven't no, called for no. any change apart from a shortening of the woodcock shooting season in line with what loads of people in the shooting industry say they would like. And did yeah. the shooting industry yeah. come out and say, yeah, we're all doing this anyway, wouldn't make any difference to us? change the shooting season quite sensible no well i think there's a there's a trust issue um which we should all seek to repair um in going i mean would you not agree you wouldn't agree well i would i think that was an opportunity that shooting missed if if wild justice is asking for something that most of shooting seems to agree with and yet shooting doesn't publicly agree with it that's a trust issue you didn't move, you didn't endear yourselves to me with your lack of collaboration on that. Yeah. No, interesting. Interesting. I yeah. 
how do you think i mean my last thing how 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 would you like shooting to look in 25 30 years you know what's your perfect scenario is it so it's, it's harvesting wild birds in in improved landscapes that's that's where you would like to see it get to yeah i'd like uh driven grey shooting to have disappeared uh i mean i've got to say that because i've been campaigning on that for <laughs> nearly 10 years and I, it wasn't just a win that's what i want so i don't want anybody to think that i've ducked that so yeah. end to driven grey shooting as quickly as possible, move the rest of shooting to a much more sustainable footing. Don't shoot with lead. We haven't touched on that. Another poor performance by shooting. You know, we've been talking about this for 30 years. Hasn't mm. happened yet. Mm. You, you could just get on with it. Uh, move to a much more um, sustainable wild harvest type situation. And then yeah, you're not yeah. going to get me out coming shooting wild grey partridges or wild pheasants or wild mallard, but you can get on with it. Don't worry yeah. me, you get on with it. I don't know what I'll be campaigning about then. It'll be something else. Well, I really, uh, I really appreciate it, Mark. You know, you've been, you've been a. Uh, um... You've all, you've almost been a sort of welcome thorn in our side over the six years I've been editing Shooting Times, um, and I and I believe you, you do read the magazine quite closely. Uh, it's a magazine that I very much enjoyed editing, um, so I, I hope that it continues to go from strength to strength. And uh, thank you, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I think Shooting Times um, is a, it's an amazing publication, really, because it comes out every week. And there isn't that much mm. that changes from week to week. And uh, But you managed to fill a weekly magazine. So Wild Justice has been a godsend to you because you can write about us every other week or so. But I think the quality of writing, and I've said this before in Shooting Times, is far higher than in birding magazines or BBC Wildlife, all those natural history magazines. You do have, and have had for a long time, some very good writers. And that's one of the reasons I read it. That's also the reason I read The Spectator, because there, there are lots of good writers, even though I disagree with almost everything that they write. It's still a pleasure to read good English and a case well made, even if it's bonkers. So, Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And we will put the link to your very good book in the show notes. Mm-hmm.